So the University of Waterloo is situated on the Haldimand Tract, the land promised to the Six Nations, which includes six miles on each side of the Grand River. We're here today uh, for a co-sponsored event between the St. Drums University and the Confederation Debates, a project that's dedicated to bringing Canada's re uh, founding records online. A digitization project with some uh, technical problems. Yes. Oh. Like that one. Oh, to the back. Oh, to the back. Oh. Thanks, oh. Wendy. Awesome. All right, here we go. <laughs> So the project is, as Canada evolved, of course, many provinces joined over time from the 1860s right up to 1949 with Newfoundland joining. Every time a province joined, that colony's legislature debated whether or not they should join, and there were people for and against the, t the terms of union. Similarly, after 1867, the federal government debated whether or not a province should be allowed in under the terms being negotiated. Is British Columbia getting too sweet a deal with the railway, for example? These were topics of debate. The Confederation Debates brings all of those records together and puts them into dialogue for the first time in their entirety. Similarly, we're taking the text of the, uh, the Numbered Treaty, something Professor Miller is going to be talking about shortly in much more detail, and we're bringing the, those records of those treaties and the records of their negotiation into dialogue with these parliamentary records. It's about 6,000 pages of text at all. Next slide, please. We have a lot of supporters, several provinces, Google, uh, the Crabtree Foundation has been very generous, Shirk, uh, York University, of course, St. Jerome's University, which is hosting large portions of this project. We're very fortunate in all of the support we have, but, Whitney, next slide. We have a problem that we are hoping uh, many of you or people you know can help us with. Uh, when we take these texts, we get them from uh, digitizing partners like the Parliament of Canada or Early Canadiana, or we digitize them ourselves, we run them through uh, software to turn it into searchable text. But then, as many of you know, if you've used um, um, OCR software on your cell phone or whatever, the, 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 the conversion into searchable text is never perfect. It's very imperfect in many cases. So, uh, we have developed a website where people can go online, anybody, you just use your Google or your Facebook ID, you pick a province that you're interested in, and you can read a page from our founding debates. And all we ask is you watch our three and a half minute YouTube video, look on the right side, and make it match the left. Very simple, most pages take you five to 10 minutes. We log all of this information uh, as we disseminate this information, or actually not quite yet, sorry. But we want you to do more than just read it uh, and check the text. You see the big orange button at the top says memorable text. If you read anything that's funny, um, um, pr uh, prophetic, even offensive. We want you to tell us about it, because very often historians haven't looked at this material in a little while. Uh, so when you click that button, it takes you to a form where you just copy and paste the text and you tell us about it. Next page. You can do this from anywhere. Again, all you need is a Google or a Facebook ID, an internet connection, and Google Chrome. Next slide. This is a national legacy project. All of the materials are going to be hosted by the University of Victoria in perpetuity uh, for free. All of our deliverables will be available for free from the website. We log everything everyone does. So who here ha is uh, either, probably not many here, in high school or know somebody who's in high school here in Ontario? Couple people. Every student has to do volunteer hours, right? This counts. We're a nonprofit um, in, uh, institution, or a nonprofit project, more correctly, uh, and we log everything people do. So we can tell you when you logged in, how long it took you to work on a page, and to finish it. The student sends us the form. They can do their volunteer hours from home. They can learn about Canadian history at the same time. They learn about citizenship, about parliamentary democracy, about uh, the numbered treaties, depending on what they choose to read, and complete their volunteer hours at the same time. Retirees, similarly, if you're celebrating Canada 150 and you know somebody who might not be able to get out to a lot of the events for Canada 150, this is something they can do from their home. And there's a lot of interesting material. I mean, here we have uh, Antoine Dorian. We publish uh, a lot of these quote, uh, quotes on social media. Here's Dorian saying, I thank God, sir, I never insulted Upper Canada like some of those who reviled me. I never compared the people of Upper Canada to so many codfish. I showed on the contrary and he goes on, on. The material is interesting. 
engaging. If you're into political history in any way, shape, or form, or Canadian politics, I really encourage you to have a look. It's engaging stuff. Whitney, next slide, please. And like I said, we want you to know, we want to know what you think. The reporting is very simple. You just click that button, you get a Google form, and you keep going, and you copy and paste the text, and, and we use those reports to develop those quotes of the day and uh, other materials I'm going to talk about momentarily. Next slide. Joining is really easy. Next slide. You go to our website. That's a picture of it. <laughs> you watch our three and a half minute YouTube video. It shows you how to log in, how to edit a page, what to look for, how to submit memorable quotes, how to report typos in the original text, all in three and a half minutes. Then you pick a page and you mimic what you saw in the video. It's not at all hard. Uh, to make it clear, all of this, again, will be on a University of Victoria website. All of our deliverables, whether they're ebooks, whether they're the quotes of the day, whether they're lesson plans for grade 7, 8, and high school students, uh, all of the stuff you're doing goes into all of those deliverables and they will be preserved in perpetuity. So it's a very worthwhile endeavor. So with that, uh, Catherine, please. Good evening, my name is Dr. Catherine Bergman and I'm the President and Vice Chancellor at St. Jerome's University. And it is my privilege and pleasure to introduce tonight's speaker. Dr. James R. Miller is Professor Emeritus of History in the College of Arts and Science at the University of Saskatchewan and was awarded the 2014 Killam Prize in the Humanities. The Killam Prizes are among Canada's top awards for scholars and scientists. Issued by the Canada Council for the Arts, they acknowledge outstanding researchers who have made contributions with national or international impact. Widely considered Canada's leading expert in the field of native newcomer relations, Dr. Miller was chosen for the award on the basis of his exceptional research career and lifetime contributions to public service. When notified he was receiving the award, surprise and disbelief were his first reactions, he said. He then added, I consider it a wonderful, if unexpected, honor. In 1989, Jim authored Skyscrapers Hide the Heavens, the first comprehensive history of native newcomer relations in Canada. His research and writings have played an essential role in bringing to light the history of the country's Aboriginal residential schools. He is a respected consultant to both government and First Nations organizations on treaty and residential school issues, as well as a regular commentator for national and international media. Dr. Miller was also awarded a Canada Research Chair in Native Newcomer Relations in 2001 in recognition of the excellence and importance of his research program. This area of study has been a fruitful one for Jim, who said his research was always driven by a desire to understand the poor relations that exist between Native and non-Native people today. In Jim's words, my efforts to find an explanation took me back to the earliest days of contact between Europeans and Aboriginal people. All of my research for the last 30 years has tried to explain how and why relations went sour sometime after Europeans came to the northern part of North America. In 2015, Dr. Miller was awarded, sorry, was made Officer of the Order of Canada. In the words of Dr. Peter Stoichev, President and Vice Chancellor at the University of Saskatchewan, no one could be more deserving of these honours than Dr. Miller, who has given so much insight into one of the defining topics of Canadian history. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Dr. Miller to the podium to talk about Confederation and Indigenous treaty making in Canada.
Thank you and good evening, and thank you for coming out on a Saturday evening. I'm sure there are other things you might be doing. You're going to do the slides, Kvitty? Okay. The link between Confederation and post-Confederation treaty making, I think, is found in uh, Section 146 of the British North America Act, or as it's known nowadays, Canada Act 1867. A provision among the terms of union for the accession, the addition of a series of territories, particularly in the West, and the ones that are most relevant immediately to treaty making are those that deal with Rupert's Land or the Hudson's Bay Company territory. So that the Fathers of Confederation and the early political leaders looked forward to treaty making as because it was part of the original Confederation deal. But as they looked forward to doing that, they were informed by a very long history of relationship and of treaty making that would do a lot to shape how they would go about making those treaties with Western First Nations. At the heart of that long tradition was a time of commercial partnership, a time when trade was the dominant reason for relations between indigenous people and newcomers, particularly trade in the furs, and to it was added, of course, the matter of military alliance and diplomatic mutual support. And one of the fascinating things about that first phase of treaty making, because I think commercial compacts are treaties, though they're not usually called that, is the way in which Europeans had to learn to do things as the First Nations did them. Well, what did that mean? Well, for First Nations, if you wanted to deal with strangers, and these were all strangers coming ashore, you couldn't just start casually. Rather, you had to make them kinfolk. You had to create what the anthropologists call a scribe kinship. And how did First Nations do that? They did that through ceremony. Ceremonies such as formal welcomes, dresses of welcome, feasting together, and above all, smoking the pipe together. And Europeans had to learn to do that, and they did learn to do that. They learned to do that in the fur trade, and they learned to do that in the military alliances. This gentleman, Sir William Johnson, was a prime example of how the European adapted to dealing with indigenous people by their methods in these early periods. The effectiveness of that relationship, and particularly in the 1700s, it becomes one that emphasizes alliance and diplomacy more than commerce, at least in Eastern Canada. The effectiveness of those relationships is shown by people like Joseph Brandt, Tyndanaga. A Mohawk leader, married, or pardon me, related by marriage to Sir William Johnson. Molly Brandt, his sister, was Sir William's partner. And he was key, before he was key to creating the Six Nations Reserve on the ground, in holding the Mohawk in alliance with Britain during the American Revolutionary War. So what you have is a pattern of indigenous influenced and shaped commercial relations which segue into as well diplomatic military alliance relations and they will also they will culminate with me they will culminate in the war of 1812 when of course this great leader the Shawnee leader Tecumseh forges an incredible alliance with First Nations of the Interior to fight not so much with the British and Upper Canadians as against the Americans, because what was motivating Brandt was motivating Tecumseh, what had motivated Pontiac earlier in the 1760s, was trying to repel and resist and hold back the expansionist agrarians who became later on the Americans. What's this got to do with treaties, you might be thinking? Well, there is, there is a connection, and it, it comes in this document. Out of the period of alliance and relationship emerges what we call the Royal Proclamation of 1763, probably the single most important document in the history of Aboriginal Crown treaty making. 
the Royal Proclamation is initially, at least, a unilateral crown document, as the na title suggests. And what it does is it asserts crown ownership of all of North America. But as well as that, it does acknowledge and promise support for certain indigenous possessory rights. It talks about Indian nations who are in, who, whom we support, or who we support us. And it talks about reserving lands for them as their hunting grounds. Not only that, and he's finally getting to treaties now, not only that, but it goes on to say, and if they wish to surrender any of that land, it shall be done only to us at a public meeting called for the purpose. You know, every one of those words is pregnant with meaning. Us, of course, is the crown. If First Nations are willing to share or divest themselves of territory, the proclamation says it shall be done only to the crown, not to settlers, not the land speculators, but to the crown. And it must be done openly. There can be no kind of games going on, dishonest dealings. And the meeting must be called specifically for that purpose of discussing the transfer of land. The Royal Proclamation becomes the foundation of the third period of treaty making in our history. We had commercial compacts, we had treaties of peace and friendship during the time of alliance and military mutual support. From 1764 until 1923, what we have principally, almost exclusively, is a third form of treaty called territorial treaty making. And the implementation, codification of the practice based on the Royal Proclamation takes place in this part of the world, in Upper Canada, as it becomes known, or later in Ontario. And a succession of ways, there's a series of treaties made. And the first are the treaties that are made in anticipation of settling Loyalists from the, after the revolution, and loyalists are both Caucasian and First Nations, as we know in the case of the Six Nations. And the treaties are made with the Mississauga along the front, which is to say along the waterways, which were the means of transportation and communication at the time. These treaties, which employed a lot of that indigenous ceremony I tried to describe very briefly, were made in return for one-time payments. And that's the first phase. After the War of 1812, there is a need to do the same thing again. And in the second phase, in the second phase, it's sort of the next range up or inland of territory. And again, the negotiation is principally with the Mississauga and it is principally embedded in a kinship-making series of ceremonial practices. In the second phase, there is an important shift. They shift from one-time upfront payments to a system, rather, of annuities, smaller annual payments by the Crown to First Nations. And this, too, will set a pattern. <clears throat> the third phase, takes place in Ontario's near north. These are the Robinson Treaties of 1850 and the Manitouan Island Treaty of 1862. And these treaties, too, add something to this growing treaty-making protocol that's developing based on the Royal Proclamation. We're shifting now, when we move to the near north, from lands for agriculture for settlers to lands intended to be a place where they extract resources, principally mineral resources, in the early going, though the Manitoulin Island Treaty is also greatly about fisheries and access to native-controlled fisheries. Reserves at this point in the Robinson Treaties become an indelible, in inevitable accompaniment of treaty making. This is when they get incorporated in treaties. 
And the third important thing about the Robinson Treaties of 1850, and I should say those Robinson Treaties include both Robinson Huron and Robinson Superior, named for the lakes to which the territories are adjacent. The Robinson Treaties also contain an explicit recognition by the Crown of continuing gathering rights, hunting and fishing rights on the part of the First Nations. While this treaty making based on the Royal Proclamation is becoming solidified into a protocol that will influence the early leaders after Confederation, there's something else going on though. At the same time, beginning in the 1830s, the state is beginning to shift in its treatment and relationship with indigenous people. By 1830s, the British Crown is still calling the shots at this time says, well, First Nations or Indians are no longer useful to us as military allies because we've normalized relations with the United States. You know, we fought the last war with them. And now what First Nations represent to the British Crown is expense. Simultaneously, by the 1830s, as immigration swells in Upper Canada and agricultural settlement precedes the pace, First Nations are increasingly viewed by the indigenous population as an impediment to the development of the kind of economy they want, which is an economy based on sedentary agriculture and commerce, principally. And the outgrowth of those new perceptions is an altered relationship, a relationship in a sense embodied in this image, which is called Numbering the Indians. That's its title. Well, you know, if you know your social science, you'll know that when the state wants to do something to you, it counts, it counts to conduct censuses. And this is a manifestation of the new era of what was called at the time, offensively, no doubt, the civilization policy directed at First Nations. And it includes things like the promotion of agriculture, the proselytization by Christian missionaries, and beginning in the 1840s particularly, residential schooling in Upper Canada. So simultaneously you have sort of the fruition, pardon me, the efflorescence and development of the treaty making tradition and the incoming, the addition of this corrosive and damaging new kind of relationship. And that's the tradition Fathers Confederation, the early leaders of the Dominion of Canada can call upon and will call upon when they turn to the question of, well, how are we going to implement Section 146? How are we going to acquire the West and integrate it into the Dominion? They had already begun thinking this way before 1869, but if they had any doubt that they had to deal, and they didn't really, any doubt that they should be dealing in advance with the Western First Nations, it would have been removed by the trouble they ran into in Red River in the late autumn and winter of 1869 and 1870, because as they barged into Red River, and that verb is chosen advisedly, of course, they paid no attention to the possessory rights of the indigenous population, especially the Métis of Red River. And what they got for it, their pains, of course, was the Red River resistance and a whole lot of trouble and expense. As I suggested, Canada would have negotiated treaties anyway because that's what they did when dealing with First Nations. But if there was any doubt, 1869-70 reinforced the necessity to do so. And so what happens is, between 1871 and 1877, we have the negotiation of the first seven numbered treaties. The process actually starts a bit early. It starts in 1869, that is, the process of negotiation. It starts in what's called the Northwest Angle of, of Northwestern Ontario. And the reason the Treaty 3, as it becomes, is not a treaty until 1873, is there is a tremendous resistance from the First Nations and uh, consumption of time because they are, in the views of the government, very demanding of what they want for a treaty, which is to say they were standing up for their rights as they understood them. In any event, what we'll have negotiated in this period is Treaty 1, Treaty 2 in Southern Manitoba, 
Treaty 3 or the Northwest Angle Treaty in Northwestern Ontario, Treaty 4 in Southern Saskatchewan, Treaty 5 in sort of middle the middle of Manitoba, Treaty 6 of the central regions of Alberta and Saskatchewan as they now are, and then Treaty 7 in 1877, which is Southern Alberta. <laughs> So what these first numbered treaties represent then is acquisition or right of peaceful access for Canada to an enormous territory, which had earlier been not controlled so much, but certainly influenced by the Europeans known as the Hudson's Bay Company. Now it's perfectly obvious why Canada wants to make treaties. They want peaceful access, and they know how to do it because they've made treaties for a long time. But a related and perhaps more important question is, well, that's all very well, but why did Western First Nations enter into negotiations and most of them agree to make treaties? Well, Western First Nations were still vibrant, effective collectivities, and in the Prairie region they probably numbered something over 20,000 people. Canada had almost no one there. So there are certainly people you have to take account of. But although they are numerous and there are still strong societies, they are societies with diff facing difficulties. No, could I have the next one? None more important than what they see as the rapid decline of the bison resource. And the bison is the foundation of Plains culture, Plains society, and the Plains economy. As corn was to the Haudenosaunee and the Wendat, for example, or as salmon was to the First Nations of the Northwest Coast, so the bison was to the Plains people. It was all important, but it was obvious by the 1870s, and First Nations leaders said this clearly, it was obvious that it was declining. They had other problems that were worrying them as well. They'd been through a period of epidemic disease, and they had lost significant numbers. They were weakened. They also had been through a period of intertribal warfare on the plains, ending only in 1871. And the warfare of that era, principally between the Blackfoot and the Cree, but there are other groups involved, is really all about competition for the shrinking bison resource. So First Nations societies are strong, but First Nations leaders are, are aware that, hmm, there are growing difficulties facing us. And the final thing that motivates those who are willing to negotiate is the knowledge that immigrants are going to come. They're being told that by the small number of Christian missionaries in the West and the Hudson's Bay Company personnel. And if they weren't being told that by people in their own territory, they merely had to look south of the medicine line to what was happening to their kinfolk in the United States. Because in 1870, when there were perhaps 12,000 people in, in the West, in the interior West, there were over a million people in the American West. And there, what it had set off was the dislocation of the Native Americans and incessant warfare as the cavalry basically tried to clear out the Native Americans. So First Nations leaders know all this. They're very conscious of it, and many of them, by no means all, are willing, for that reason, to negotiate with Canada. I emphasize by no means all because there were a number who didn't see it that way. And there tended to be, it's not perfect congruence, but there tended to be a difference of perception between younger leaders and older leaders. Two of the most influential pro-treaty older leaders are on the left front, a Takaku, star blanket, and on the right front, Mr. Wassis. A third one that's sort of in the same category amongst the Plains people would be Crowfoot of, of the Blackfoot Confederacy. And these leaders see treaty with Canada as a solution to the problems that they're facing. And they say these things very clearly. They say it, for example, in a private caucus that is held in, 
at Fort Carlton, could you have the next slide? Mm -hmm. At Fort Carlton in August of 1876, when the Crown is trying to negotiate what will become Treaty 6. And there, there is a debate. This is a caucus just of the First Nations leaders and the interpreter, uh, Taka Coop and Mr. Wassis had hired on their own, Peter Erasmus, a Métis man. This is a caucus where they're just having it all out to try to create a unified position before they meet again with Commissioner Morris and the other Canadian commissioners. And people like Ataka Coop and Mr. Wasis say, well, there are all these problems that I've described to you. The bison used to be without number, and now they're shrinking very, very rapidly. And they say things like, I, I ask Poundmaker, the Badger, and the others who are opposed to making treaty, what do you have to offer in its place? What's your solution? Of course, they really don't have an answer. And the Taka Coop and Mr. Wassis and Crowfoot in Treaty 7 basically say, for my part, I see relationship with the Queen's people as a solution. I will take the Queen's hand, they say. What they're talking about, of course, is we will make kin of the newcomer through the, through the Queen, through Victoria. And in the, in the Prairie Treaties of the 1870s, Ceremony comes in again in a very, very major way, as with one exception in Treaty 4, all the treaty negotiations are embedded in the kind of ceremonialism and other forms that I didn't describe. So they're making kinfolk of the newcomers, because that's how they understand it. The other thing that, um, that they understand the treaties to mean is their covenants. What, they, what that means is their agreements not just between the Queen and the Queen's people and themselves, but also the Supreme Being, the Great Spirit, or you people call it God, whatever. And one of the striking things about the treaty, the treaty negotiations of the 1870s, even if you read the Canadian government version of it, is how shot through with religious imagery and practice and rhetoric they all are. At the same time, they're shot through with the rhetoric of kinship. So they talk about our great white mother, the queen, and they talk about, Morris talks about the queen's children. It's not understood and not meant as an offensive or patronizing term at all. It's meant as an evocation of that kinship and the kin relationship, which First Nations believe in because that's how they do things. That's how they related to the Hudson's Bay Company for two centuries before Alexander Morris and the rest actually turned up. So what we have implicit in the number of treaties of the 1870s is a difference of perception of what the treaties are about. Alexander Morris, the chief commissioner for several of the treaties, uses the rhetoric of kinship over well all the time and very effectively. He's kind of a latter-day William Johnson in terms of his ability to negotiate effectively. And I think he meant, I meant it at the time. But what wasn't mentioned very much, except in Treaty 7 in 1877, was at the same time, or actually if just a few months before Mr. Wassis and Ataka Coop made Treaty 6, a few months before that, in April of 1876, Canada passed, the Parliament of Canada passed the Indian Act, consolidation of existing provisions for relating, for the Crown's relations with Indians. So what you have is an enormous, indeed a fatal contrast between First Nations entering into treaties, believing we've enlarged, sorry, enlarged the circle of kinship and we've taken these newcomers in, into our circle. And Canada, at the same time, passing legislation that will establish the relationship between government, First Nations, not as a kin-like relationship, but a relationship between trustee, and ward. 
The Indian Act creates a relationship of legal infantilism for First Nations. The Crown is their trustee. They are wards of the Crown and of government. And you couldn't have a bigger contrast between what the Parliament did in April 7, 1876 and the rhetoric that was used on the plains in later that summer and again in 1877 about kinship. And in that contrast is a fatal flaw that will cause enormous difficulty between Indigenous peoples and the rest of Canadians, especially their government, for the rest of Canadian history. After 1877, there is a hiatus in treaty making. And that hiatus is caused by the government of Canada. Because later in the 1880s through the 1890s, there is a succession of First Nations who are asking for treaties in more remote areas, as more, more northerly areas, for a variety of reasons. But Canada is uninterested. Canada has acquired access or ownership of an enormous empire in the West already, and it will take decades for it to integrate those regions economically. It will take decades to make the agricultural economy, which was the purpose of making the treaties in the plains, a reality, and that will really take place only by about the Great War, the First World War. So at all that time, Crown simply ignores requests from treaty from more northerly peoples. Until, <clears throat> until things change. Could have the next one, Whitney. And it changes for pretty much the same reason that we saw at work leading to the first seven number treaties that Canada wants something. And what Canada wants now, from the late 1890s through to 1921, is access to resource-rich territories. And I won't bore you with all the details, but it's kicked off in 18, between 1896 and 1898 in, with the Klondike Gold Rush in Yukon. And what Treaty 8 is about is, <coughs> <laughs> is about peaceful access to Yukon via the overland route. Come the next one too, please. Uh, me... As you can see from the slide, Treaty 8 brings to Canada peaceful access to what one of the treaty commissioners says, an empire in itself, and it is indeed an empire, a territorial empire. It stretches from the northeast corner of British Columbia through northern Alberta into part of northwestern Saskatchewan. It's absolutely enormous territory. Following that, Canada also negotiates for access to resource-rich territory in Northern Ontario. It will negotiate Treaty 9 in Northern Ontario in 1906. While this is happening, while we're transitioning from the first seven number treaties to the next four, the final four number treaties, there is, as I sort of suggested when we're talking about the Indian Act, a shift going on in attitudes on the part of government. And nobody epitomizes the changed attitude better or worse than this man, because this is Duncan Campbell Scott, who is, of course, the author of many malignant policies directed towards First Nations. He will become a Deputy Minister of Indian Affairs just before World War I. But he's also the Chief Commissioner of Treaty 9 negotiations in Northern Ontario. And now what it's all about is access to resource-rich, mineral-rich lands in the north. Some of the First Nations in these territories have been asking for treaty for decades and been ignored. Now, when Canada wants, and this case involves Ontario too, access to those lands for entrepreneurs, for southern developers, They're, they move with alacrity to negotiate Treaty 9. This is the treaty party approaching 
First Nations village, part of the negotiations of Treaty 9. And what's interesting about this image is that what you see replicated there is a reenactment of the fur, a fur trade practice. Because back in the fur trade, when a brigade of First Nations traders were going to go to a trading post, when they were getting closer to the post, they would stop, go ashore, put on their finest clothes, decorate themselves, and then array themselves like that across the body of water and approach that way. And then would ensue the formal welcomes, the feasting, the exchange of gifts, the smoking of the pipe, basically. So here you have Canada consciously or unconsciously <laughs> imitating fur trade protocol. But one of the striking things about the second group of numbered treaties was the way in which ceremony is very, very much de-emphasized compared to the first seven. About the only remnant <laughs> the only remnant of ceremony in the later number of treaties is the feast that was held at the conclusion of every set of treaty negotiations. Treaty 10 was really about gaining access to regularizing the situation across northern Saskatchewan and northern <laughs> Manitoba. <Pardon me. laughs> Remember that Alberta and Saskatchewan had been created as provinces in 1905. And the final step in the making of the Northern Numbered Treaties is the making of, of Treaty 11, which perhaps as well as Treaty 8 exemplifies my basic point that Canada is interested in making treaty only if and when it wants access to particular resources or a region of resources. Because here too, in, in Treaty 11, which kind of southern, southern territories, or southern NWT territories, First Nations had been petitioning for treaty for decades and had been systematically and repeatedly and uniformly ignored every time. Until in 1920, oil was discovered at Norman Wells in the NWT. 1921, you get Treaty 11, negotiate. Couldn't be a clearer example of the way in which Canada's movement, actions, motivation in making treaties is nothing but self-interest, selfish if you prefer, because that's exactly what it was. Treaty 11 is, with two minor exceptions that hardly bear, deserve the name of treaty, the end of the classical period of, of treaty making. In 1922, there are two other agreements uh, concluded in Ontario called the Williams Treaties. And as I say, these really don't deserve very much the name of, of treaties making because what they're about is clearing up a bunch of anomalies and mistakes and oversight from the very earliest period of Upper Canadian treaty making, the 1780s, 1790s. And they just regularize and head off the possibility of difficulties in those territories. And then, after 1923, for half a century, no treaties are made. Duncan Campbell Scott is Deputy Minister of Indian Affairs for another decade or so. Then the Depression comes along, and then there's World War II, and we have an empire in itself. We have not absorbed it, integrated it economically, but it's not developed. We have not developed all the resources of those areas we acquired between 1899 and 1921, Treaty 8 to Treaty 11. So Canada doesn't make any treaties until the 1970s. And then in 1973, the Supreme Court of Canada issues a ruling called the Nishkar ruling or the Calder ruling, which although it is a loss for the Nishka, legally speaking, is in fact a triumph because for ways I won't bore you with unless you ask, um, the six of the seven judges that ruled on it find that there is something in law, common law, called Aboriginal title. Now that sounds 
pretty obvious in, in 2017, but it was a revolutionary notion in 1973. So revolutionary, in fact, that when the next week, Pierre Trudeau, Prime Minister of the day, who had issued a white paper which intended to wipe out treaties and Indian Act and First Nations and just about everything, and who had said then, well, we can't make treaties with First Nations because, he, you know, Aboriginal title, you can't make policy based on historical might have beens, he says. So the next week he meets with a delegation from BC where there are almost no territory covered by treaty. And he says to them, well, I guess you had more rights than we thought you did when we, when we made the white paper. And so to their credit, the federal government responds by creating a process called the Comprehensive Claims Settlement. In fact, a settlement for claims of both comprehensive claims, specific claims. Comprehensive claims are Aboriginal title claims. They're statements, assertions by the First Nations. This is our territory. You've never dealt with us and made an agreement. You certainly never conquered us militarily because you know, no First Nation was conquered by Canada in our history. So therefore, it's still ours. And now the Supreme Court has said, an Aboriginal title does exist in law. So they're trying to deal with it, and they set up a negotiation schema. The first product of that, although it had really begun life as a separate negotiation, is the James Bay and Northern Quebec Agreement of 1975, which deals with unsurrendered title in the James, part of the James Bay watershed of Northern Quebec. And that's, that's the initiation of a fourth period of treaty making, but that's another story. Thank you. Great, well thank you Professor Miller. I'm Whitney Lockerbar, I'm a professor here at St. Jerome's University. Very pleased to entertain questions, some commentary. I think that was a wonderful, pardon me? Oh, please use the microphones if you have a question or a comment, if you please. Uh, thank you for that sweeping overview. I think given the moment that we find ourselves as a country, reflecting on truth, reconciliation, what we can do as Canadians to revitalize these treaty relationships and the emphasis that you've placed on relationships, these, uh, these as living documents and, and living relationships at their core, I think it's very helpful for you to, to map out this rich history of going from the notion of these commercial compounds tax to the contract version of land transactions, at least during the eyes of the Canadian state, to now seeing these as covenants and to reflect upon uh, what that history means in terms of the present. So I'll go first then asking a question. So you've been involved, I understand you have a book that you're, that's going to be coming out very shortly on the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, and part of that process just recently appeared before a Senate uh, committee hearing on it. wonder if you could reflect for us upon the intersection between your understandings of the treaty as they've, they've evolved over the, the recent decades, and how that comes to bear on this moment that we find ourselves you're coming to terms as, as, from my position, situated as a non-Indigenous Canadian, understanding what it means to be a party to this treaty, a party to this covenant, what I can do to be part of a healing process or an understanding process, a truth and reconciliation process. <clears throat> Pardon me. As I tried to signal, I think one of the, the manifestations, is not necessarily a cause of the problem, but one of the manifestations of the problem we have is the different understandings of treaty or the different bases for relating in the state with First Nations people. Are we in a treaty relationship where we're all kinfolk and owe mutual support and respect to each other? Or are we in a trustee ward relationship, Indian Act relationship? That's the problem, but it seems to me it's also the potential basis of a solution. If we can recover the understanding that we have that kind of relationship, I think we have the basis for promoting a healthier relationship for reconciliation. But, you know, this will require two things. One is, is education. You know, you ask a professor, well, how do you solve something? The professor always says, well, education. Well, that's, I mean, that's what we do, right? Uh, and that is part of it, because Canadians do not understand that history. 
It's a little depressing for those of us in the field because the interpretation of the relationship that I tried to outline for you is one that's been in place in the academy for 30 years, but it has not seeped through to the general population at all. And I think we academics, pardon me, I'm retired, you academics <laughs> uh, have to ask yourselves, well, why is that and how can we do it better? But I think education is part of the answer. The other thing that I think is required is redress. I don't think it's enough to talk only about reconciliation. I think there must be some redress as well as efforts to re reconciliation. We could do something about the 1,000 claims that are outstanding. We could do something about the horrific gap in funding for reserve schools compared to the rest of the publicly supported system. We could do something as a Canadian Human Rights Tribunal told government to do over a year ago about the fund underfunding of childcare. So education, redress, reconciliation, and as the TRC said, their definition of reconciliation was the restoration and maintenance of mutual respect. And it seems to me a treaty-like relationship is all about mutual support and respect. If we can convince people, get them to understand that that is what our history is about, I think that will help a lot. I come from a province where it's generally accepted, at least by elite groups. And by elite groups, I mean business people, political leaders, academics, the educational establishment, and people, professionals. In Saskatchewan, it is commonplace for everyone to say, we are all treaty people. That, that is coin of the realm, rhetorically speaking. That is what people will say they believe. Well, you know, we could extend it beyond my province. If you look at the agreements I talked about, they were made from coast to coast in this country. And in a real sense, historically speaking, all Canadians are treaty people. And the trick is to get them to understand that. I think. Stop. Yeah, it's My question is was the next story um, post 1975-1976 and sort of piggybacks on um, what to do next. Uh, you mentioned education, um, reconciliation, and a number of other things. I mean, one of the things also is policy. You have to change some policy. So you have things like the duty to accommodate, um, which, I mean, there's a diverse amount of opinion on how that gets implemented and so on. So can you talk about some of the policy implications that education and some of the cultural differences that you're sort of advocating for may be implemented into policy? Well, I, I mentioned a few things, um, you know, get to work in a more serious way on the claims, get to work on underfunding school, get to work on underfunding child care. Um, We desperately need a change in attitude in the Department of Justice and the Department of Indian Affairs because what's going on in Ottawa at the moment, if you talk to people in the bureaucracy, is that while the top guy and top gal, Justin Trudeau and Carolyn Bennett, are talking about a renewed relationship, are talking about a nation-to-nation -nation relationship, are talking about implementing all 94 calls to action of the TRC, the ugly reality is that further down in the bureaucracy, it ain't happening. It's not being taken up. Justice is still fighting every bloody case one by one. My colleague Bill Wazer uh, was an expert witness in a case before the, the, the uh, Specific Claims Tribunal dealing with unpaid annuities from 1885 and thereafter. And they won. They won big in the case of the Mistawasis First Nation. And the lawyer, Ron Maurice, for, for that says, well, guess what? I've got another 12 cases exactly like it. So, Crown, would you like to sit down and talk about a settlement of all those? Well, you know, live in hope, but so far the Crown has not been all that interested. 
The Canadian Human Rights Tribunal ruled in Cindy Blackstock's complaint, as, as I mentioned, it hasn't been implemented. The tribunal said again, get on it. Hasn't been seen. The foot dragging in the bureaucracy is a huge problem. What can change that? Well, I think an aroused citizenry could. And so we're back at education and public education. I, I continue to believe, well, my reconciliation book argues this, so I guess I have to believe it, um, that if, they, if we knew our history better, and if we historians taught our history better, then we'd be some distance towards dealing with that problem. Hi there. I, I guess this is kind of an extension uh, related to policy and, and uh, maybe the extension to the citizenry. Uh, I, it seems to me, at least uh, from an observation, uh, you know, as a, as a layperson, that the uh, that there is kind of a uh, uh, that pipelines and there's a kind of a certain agenda that kind of make it on to, to the public uh, purview and it, it's stories like pipe top pipelines. Um, Idle No More would be another example. And uh, as someone who has been observing Idle No More, they've, there was also a, quite a large um, online uh, movement even on, uh, what was it, October 7th of 2013, uh, which would have been the uh, 20, 250th anniversary of the Royal Proclamation, uh, which really, uh, as far as I'm, I know, was kind of ignored by Settler Canada and, and not really part of that. And I mean, to go further even more, there was a policy put forth by Sean Atlio, who's an educator, who kind of built his, his kind of uh, agenda uh, as a First Nations leader uh, for an education policy that would change, and and he kind of lost on that battle as well. Partly, be, or not partly, a lot, of, from my perspective, from the lack of trust between the state and the First Nations people. So I guess my question would be, you know, as how do does a, does a society kind of put things on the agenda to make actual change uh, when we have all these kinds of uh, conflicts and, and differences of opinion, because I would argue that a lot of the people who were involved with the pipelines ended up being against the education uh, agenda as very strongly because they s associated it with Harper and, and the not Alberta oil agenda. So just that. Well, I, I think we've, we've had references to a couple of things that are, are relevant, at least in my mind, <coughs> to what you're asking. <coughs> One is the duty to consult, which was, was mentioned, but the Supreme Court has said there is a duty to consult, even where there are treaties, if you're going to develop resources in, in Aboriginal lands, you have to consult them before doing so. Well, I mean, a shocking number, and that's the Crown duty, not the company's duties. The Harper government systematically tried to shove the responsibility onto the corporations, but it doesn't wash. It's not good enough, the court says. So that, that's an issue. As far as I don't know more is concerned, of course, one of their big preoccupations was, <coughs> pardon me, changes to legislation that they believed, I think legitimately, jeopardized water, essentially. And that was a big concern too. One of the things that's often not recognized properly about Idle No More is that Idle No More was not just a criticism of government. Idle No More was an implicit criticism of First Nations political leadership. The reason those four women in Saskatoon organized Idle No More was they were fed up with the male political leadership of the provincial organizations and the Assembly of First Nations. And they use social media to mobilize another, another uh, area of strength. And maybe that's part of the answer, what do we do, is make better use, since historians apparently are useless in this regard, uh, make better use of social, safe social media to inform and, and mobilize people. So I'm not, it's not a very cogent or coherent answer to your question, but those are a couple of things that occurred to me in, in responding to it. If I've missed something, please say so, and I'll try it again. Jim, I wanted to follow up a bit on your comments. Oh, sorry. 
I want to follow up on your comments about you're looking, directing a lot of your frustration, I think appropriately, at the public service level, the bureaucrats within Indigenous Northern Affairs. Not saying I condone this perspective, but a Conservative leadership candidate in the last couple of weeks, going back to the old Trudeau White Paper 1969 solution of let's just get rid of Indigenous and Northern Affairs and we can solve this issue by going back. If we don't take that sort of extreme and I think easily refuted view, and instead say, are there some structural obstacles? You talk about the 1870s and the inherent contradiction or conflict between the Indian Act at the same time as you're negotiating covenants based upon mutual respect and nation-nation relationships. That inherent tension that arguably has persisted from Department of Indian Affairs right through to Indigenous and Northern Affairs today means you can have Carolyn Bennett, who at a, an event I organized last January, she was our keynote, she got up and said, I declare myself the Minister of Reconciliation. Mm -hmm. I have the Prime Minister backing me. The Minister of Justice, and you're talking about the Department of Justice's obstruction, has of course a minister who is a First Nations lawyer activist. So what I guess I'm wondering is, is it not only the policy level or the bureaucratic machinations, is there something structural in the way that our government is set up? That without saying we need to abolish or relinquish responsibility or abdicate our part as being a treaty people, as we're represented through our state, is there something structurally that you think could or should be done in reformulating and restructuring our government at the departmental level? to try and accommodate some of these new relationships or renewed relationships that you're talking about. Uh, are you asking me if we should drain the swamp? <laughs> <laughs> Social media, that's a great answer, by the way. Uh, the... No, I, I don't, I don't, first of all, I don't think it's feasible. I don't think it can be done. I mean, you just be letting yourself into uh, an unending trip to the dentist, basically, to try to do anything like that. I think other solutions have to be found. So there's no way in essence then of extricating the treaty relationship nation to nation piece from the treaty negotiating piece that seems to be in tension with indigenous and northern affairs. I, there was a the proposal back in the day of the Indian Claims Commission as having power where it would actually have the responsibility not looking as the Indian specific claims ICC eventually looked but the original proposals is there well, there was a the reason there was a reason that the claims commission was not implemented as originally proposed, and that was the bureaucrats were opposed to it. They didn't want a claims tribunal to have power the way the American claims tribunal did, or the Treaty of Waitangi tribunal in New, in New Zealand does, for example, and, and it was thwarted. Yeah. Pack there. And my question is, uh, I think it's a little related to the question asked before. So what I'm understanding from the meaning of kinship is that it's this very um, deeply spiritual kind of understanding of, of the world and how things relate and so on. Um, considering that, well, it appears that some of the breaking down and misunderstanding of what that meant was because of uh, the different worldviews of the two peoples. I mean, yes, the Europeans were Christian, uh, but that view is still different from what a spiritual indigenous worldview would be like. So it would seem to be that some of the, at least a part of the solution would be to be on the same wavelength, operate on the same wavelength in some in some sense. So how do you think we could reconcile the indigenous worldview and their um, heavy emphasis on not so much religiosity but spiritual spirituality and so on, and uh, um, Canada's uh, uh, secularism? How do you think we can reconcile those differences, um, which in my mind seems to be kind of like the way to move forward? I think different worldviews is, is part of the puzzle, as you're suggesting. Uh, in my province, we have a program in the schools called Teaching Treaties in the Classroom, which was created under the direction of the Office of the Treaty Commissioner. And uh, it really tries to teach our children, school children, all about those differences that, that you're referring to. But I think it's more complicated than just different worldviews, because remember, there was a William Johnson who could see, could, be, could learn, whether it was from his wife or Joseph Grant or just being a fur trader, uh, he could learn to perceive and to, to negotiate the way the First Nation did. Alexander Morris, Ontario lawyer, judge, politician, 
He could learn enough about the rhetoric of kinship to use it in negotiation. So there is no doubt a difference in, in perception. But first, but non-Native Canadians can and have learned that. So it's not, it's not simply that, I think. Speech you mentioned um, that when Canada found an interest in uh, doing a treaty, a, a treaty was concluded. When it had a reason, you know, access to resources or whatever. Um, that sort of struck me because when I read the Truth and Reconciliation Commission report, you find sentences that seem sort of out of place or slightly sort of oblique, in the sense that they say Canada is a country that is part of the global economy. Um, and then you find that there's no real reference to um, attenuating or changing the notion of Canadian sovereignty when it comes to it. I'm just wondering if that sort of skepticism or cynicism that is justified when you look at Past, if that's not uh, not right in sort of having about the reason that Canada is pursuing reconciliation today, in the sense of you know, including some sort of an, an agreement by which to access to resources, preserving Canadian sovereign claims over territory. I'm wondering if you see any ties there, or if that's even a sort of a justified connection to me. In at least some parts of Canada, um, a material motive is at play, and, and that's clear nowhere more than the province of Saskatchewan, where the indigenous population is 15 or 16 percent, and we all know that if we don't solve these problems, as a province, we don't have a future. We're like New Zealand, where the Maori are about 15 percent of the population. So yeah. That, that can be a factor, but there's more to the emergence of reconciliation as a movement, as a cause, than, than simply economic uh, interest. Because I can recommend a book on this. If, if, you, um, if you look at the story of how reconciliation emerges, it emerges in a succession of steps, with first the church is coming to grip sort of examining their souls, one might say, and coming to the conclusion that the way they're relating to indigenous people is not appropriate. It's, if you like, not Christian. And these are the churches that are involved, many of them, in running residential schools. And this process of discernment, re-enlightenment, whatever you want to call it, takes place post-World War II and kind of gets strengthened in the 60s and the 70s. And that's why the churches are the first ones to respond to the residential school legacy. And they respond in apologies between 1986 and 1998. So, you know, that, that's, that's the first part of it. And then the state responds with the Royal Commission on Aboriginal People in the 1990s. And then there's litigation, and then justice in its inimitable fashion fights those one by one until they come to the conclusion, well, I guess there's too many of them, and there's these things called class action starting, and oh, one's just been certified in Ontario, so maybe we'll just give different advice to our client, the government. Justice's client is the government. And so they now say, well, yeah, I think it makes sense to settle. And that is literally how it happens. And so then that leads to the settlement agreement 19, of 2006, implemented from 2007 onward, and the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, and a whole variety of things. Now, behind all that, though, is another factor that doesn't get enough attention, and that is the organization, mobilization, and advocacy of First Nations, Métis, and Inuit political leaders. And the principal figure there is Phil Fontaine from Manitoba, because he's pushing for first an investigation and then compensation for residential school survivors is from the late 1980s onward. And he's got a lot of company, basically. So, you know, church, state, law, react, 
And behind it all, there's constant pressure from First Nations, particularly the First Nations leadership, because the residential schools were mostly First Nations children. So I think that, that's the process that, that's really going on, basically. I kind of lost track of your question. Is that answered or? <laughs> okay, we'll just leave it there then. <laughs> is a retrospective time for a lot of Canadians, and uh, thank you again for, for coming and speaking tonight. I was wondering, in the news recently, particularly on CBC, there's been some discussion among First Nations groups about you know, whether this is a period to celebrate, how, how inclusive Canada 150 can be, whether this is their history. Um, I was wondering if you could comment uh, and maybe summarize uh, from what you said tonight and, and, or other things how non-Indigenous peoples should be remembering these treaties as we, as we look back during this sesquicentennial? If you want to take the negative view, if you're First Nations and want to take the neg negative view, say, well, okay, Confederation leads to treaties and we don't like treaties, so we don't want any part of it. But equally, and there's no unanimity, as you know, amongst indigenous peoples, right, in Canada on, on anything, nor should there be. Equally, you can take the position, well, treaties are not just about settlers. Treaties are about all of us. Treaties are the embodiment of the relationship, indigenous and immigrant. So there's no reason to be, again, treaties for First Nations. I don't think there's any reason particularly to be against Confederation, but that's their call. I mean, I'm not going to try to tell them what they should do. I think if they want to join in the celebration, that's wonderful. And if they don't, well, long may they wait, basically. Fine. I don't care. It's our party. They can cry if they want to. Mm. I, I found the, uh, your history uh, very interesting about the development of treaties and what motivated each side to do that, and I'm wondering if there are um, there are things to be learned from how the United States handled their treaty. Did it did it develop differently? I, I don't know anything about yeah. that. And can we learn? Yeah, the, the um, there are both similarities and sharp differences between the Canadian and the American practice. Uh, I mean, the Americans, the 13 colonies, were also involved, covered by the Royal Proclamation of 1763. It really emerges from the northern 13 colonies. That's the principal area. But once they became very numerous, they just turned their back on that tradition. And it didn't form part of their approach to Native American groups. And what happened emerges in the 1830s in the United States is a very different basis for relationship that's quite different from the Canadian. Because the Supreme Court of the United States and, and what's known as the Marshall decisions promulgate the idea that Native American groups are, quote, domestic dependent nations. And that's a kind of good news, bad news story for Native Americans. It recognized they are natives and have to be dealt with as groups. But it also recognizes their subordinate, or claims their subordinate. And on that basis, there's quite a different approach in law and to some degree in practice. The other huge difference is demographic. I mentioned that you know, when there are perhaps 12,000 non-First Nations people in the Prairie region in 1870, there are a million people in the American West. Well, they always outnumbered First Nations throughout their history, and they always had the power, they always had the muscle to deal with them by force, and they did. Canada never had had that option. I don't think they necessarily would have taken it. They had because they had a different tradition based on the proclamation practice. We don't we'll never know. But to give you one stark example of what I'm talking about, in 1871, <clears throat> Is it 12 and 13 million or 19 and 20 million, Bill? U US and Canada, 12 and 13. 
1871, which is when the Americans, interestingly, stopped making treaties in the West, they pursue a military solution, and Canada starts making treaties in the West. In 1871, the budget of the entire federal government is $12 million. In the same year, the United States is spending $13 million a year on Western Indian wars alone. Well, you know, it just gives you an idea of the scale of difference. Canada never had that option. I like to think we wouldn't have taken it if we had it, but it's just a very different situation demographically as well as legally in the two countries. So playing on that, Jim, I mean, one of Harold Cardinal and his response to the 1969 white paper was, in the United States, the only good Indian is a dead Indian. In Canada, the only good Indian is a non-Indian. How far do you think we've come in moving beyond the sort of assimilationist mindset that drove so much of that, that I think certainly it's fair to say the first century of our relationship post-Confederation? And what are some of the areas that, that, upon your reflection over the last three decades, that Canadians may be unwittingly perpetuating some of those mm. colonial, very in, deeply embedded, we call it colonial violence or whatever language we want to use for it. Are there some areas that you think that we might be exploring or interrogating potentially more at this moment, or? Well, I don't want to be, give just a downer message completely. I mean, and it's important to emphasize because Canadians have a really bad habit of beating themselves up. Sometimes they deserve, but sometimes it goes too far. I think we also need to recognize that there has been enormous progress in the last 30 to 40 years. You know, we do have things like claims tribunals, and we do have government support for First Nations to fight the government at law to resolve problems. We have a whole variety of programs that we didn't used to have. And this, I think this is all <coughs> the good news. And I think it's important. I, I don't want to deprecate it or depreciate it. But there is a level, uh, National Post, anyone? There is a level at which the old attitudes are still alive and well. Uh, on January 31st, I, I spoke to the Senate Standing Committee on Aboriginal Peoples, and in the, we had a long question period afterwards, discussion period, <coughs> and this perfectly lovely senator from, from Manitoba, who really, I'm sure, was motivated by very positive about this, uh, said, in all seriousness, well, I was around when the white paper was issued in 1969. I thought it was wonderful. And, you know, we we're going to pay so much ahead and we we're going to solve all these problems and be done with. How much do you think we have to pay each, for each Indian now to do that? So I kind of evaded it as best I could and said, well, it wasn't just about the contents, it was about the process and the process was true. But I mean, that kind of thinking or not, th no, that's not fair. That, she, she thought about it and she thought that that was a solution. How many times have you heard or read people say, well, you know, that's all very well, but they have to join the mainstream, right? Well, what's that code for? That's code for they have to accept assimilation. The truth of the matter is that First Nations people have never <laughs> been opposed to cooperating with the mainstream. And I don't care if you're talking about economy or education or religion or whatever. They've always been open to considering, at least, and sometimes acting on what Europeans and Euro-Canadians wanted to do. But they've never wanted to do it at the cost of giving up a culture. They were interested in education. In what becomes Ontario, before Confederation, First Nations leadership agreed to support what were called manual labor schools with one twentieth of their, pardon, one fifth of their annuities for twenty years. They weren't opposed to education; they were opposed to the kind of education they got, basically. So you know, they've always been been open to it. But I think non-native society or large hunks of it still really believe that, well, they have to join the mainstream, they have to be acculturated, assimilated, whatever. 
as Tom Flanagan put it so delicately in his book, First Nations, Second Thoughts, you know, acculturation, integration, assimilate, call it what you want, they've got to get with the program, basically. They have to, have to do it our way. Well, if we can learn anything in the last 180 years, because a civilization policy started in the 1830s in Upper Canada, remember? If we've learned anything, or should have learned anything in that time, it's that they're not going to. They're not going to concede give up their culture, they're going to fight for it. And the sooner the rest of Canadians accept that and understand we have to do it differently, the better. It's the end of the sermon. This may be a naive question, but having attended the uh, Truth and Reconciliation Calls to Action for University Presidents mm -hmm. at the University of Saskatchewan uh, two years ago and at the University of Alberta this past year, and listening a lot to my Aboriginal colleagues and friends, um, it seems to me that if we're going to have reconciliation, we have to look beyond the treaties. We actually have to look at the definition of the fundamental relationship as defined in the Indian Act. As long as the government continues the paternalistic or trust-child relationship, it holds, it prevents the relationship from developing or even reconciling because there's always going to be that power imbalance. There is always going to be that, um, holding somebody as a child for their whole life is yep. to me a form of abuse. And I know that one doesn't open an act lightly, but I also know that the Indian Act has changed over time. But if we can't fix the fundamental relationship as defined in the Indian Act, I'm not sure that reconciliation is something that is ultimately ever going to be achieved. The Indian Act in 2017 still says that no, quote, Indian's will is legal without the approval of the Superintendent General of Indian Affairs. I don't think we can have a wholesale change of the Indian Act because First Nations leadership don't want it. They don't, tr tr for good reason, don't trust, trust government um, enough to agree to open it up. But I think uh, Justin Trudeau and Carolyn Bennett are trying to get at a different approach when they talk about their government is going to follow a nation-to-nation -nation approach to dealing with First Nations. I think, I think that's really what they're, they're getting at, is to, to form that new kind of relation, that, that new basis for, re, for relations. And I think, I can't speak for them, but my guess is they think that if they can do that, it will build confidence and then you can go on and do more things. The reason that I said we need to have redress and reconciliation is because it's not just the right thing to do to redress a lot of the legitimate grievances, but it will build that confidence. It will build that mutual confidence in government and the rest of society on, on, the, part of, uh, on the part of First Nations. I I hope. As far as government is concerned, uh, I once asked uh, Murray Sinclair why he thought the Prime Minister apology uh, didn't really do much. And his answer was very simple. He said, it didn't get message down to the bureaucracy. And I'm a little worried at the moment that we, that we could have a rep repeat of that because you've got the Prime Minister and the Minister of Indigenous Affairs saying the right things. And I, I believe they both sincerely believe in it. But the bureaucracy is another issue. Could I tell you a story about all this, by the way? Sure. It comes from story. South Africa. And there was a Mr. Brown and a, a white, powerful African or non-indigenous non African, African. And Mr. Tabo, who was an indigenous African. Well, Mr. Brown somehow got his hands on one of Mr. Tabo's cows and, and kept it. And there's nothing Tabo could do about it. He couldn't get the law to make Brown give up his cow. And then along came the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Mr. Brown paid attention while well, it was broadcast every night on, on the media in South Africa while it was going on. And he was moved by it. And he thought, oh, I should reach out. I should reach out to Tabo. We've had this problem. 
So we did, and they got together, and they met, and they sat down, and they talked, and they had tea together, and they laughed, embraced, and then Brown gets up to leave, and Talbot says, Mr. Brown, what about the cow? And Mr. Brown says, Tabo, we've had a lovely time. We've talked, we've had tea, we've restored our relationship, and you start raise this question about a cow. <laughs> That's what I'm talking about. Canada has to deal with the cow, the unresolved, legitimate grievances. There must be redress as well, movement towards reconciliation. Isn't it true under the Indian Act as well that it's very difficult to drive wealth into the First Nations communities because they're not allowed to own their own businesses or to, like there's a lot of things that prevent the ability for First Nations reserve communities to actually, I don't know how else to say it, but to drive wealth into the communities through, through business and that because of the restrictions and restraints placed upon them under the Indian Act. And as long as those things are in place, poverty becomes the driver, which then drives social issues, which drives a whole host of other problems. And so there has to be some sort of reconciliation of the fundamental relationships and what's what one can and cannot do off reserve if we're ever going to hope to address the poverty issues and the health issues that go with all of those things. That's what the National Post. Seriously. I don't know. I didn't read the National Post. I'm looking at it from, we work with Indigenous communities in South America, and one of the big differences is that we can draw, we can work with the communities to help empower people to drive business or wealth through their, those communities. And we've seen changes, and we've been working with Aboriginal communities in the Andean Mountains and Cafe Feminino and since 2008. And you can see the change in the community and the story that you can tell over time by empowering the people to define success for themselves and to actually drive wealth through those communities. The next time you're in Saskatoon, if you get to Saskatoon, get, I'll, I'll let be me in know. Regina in a week. I know you go to Regina instead. Yeah. Um, but if you do get to Saskatoon, let me know, and I'll I'll take you for a little drive to the Dakota White Cap Reserve, south of Saskatoon, where there's a casino, there's a world-class golf course, there's a hotel. With the right kind of leadership, the problems, and you're right, there, there are legal difficulties, of, and it's all about title to land. That, that's the basis of, of the problem. Well, it doesn't seem to be bothering Darcy Bear and the, and the, the Dakota White Cap Nation at all, because they're thriving, they're doing brilliantly. And there is a way around the fact, you see, the problem is under the Indian Act, and it's an example of that legal infantilism that I've tried to describe, the land is held not by the First Nations. The reserves are not owned by the First Nations. Well, they are in an ultimate sense, but they're held in trust for the First Nations by the government of Canada. And when that's the case, you don't have clear title, you can't mortgage land, you can't raise money for development. But there is something called certificate of possession. There is a legal mechanism, and it's used in a number of places. So it's not an, it's a, it's a difficulty, you're right. It's not an insuperable difficulty. There are ways to cope with it. And this is definitely quite different than other. Yeah, there, there's a, five First Nations owned uh, casinos, Bill? For example, yeah. I don't advocate casinos as economic development, but it works for them. Anyway, visit Saskatoon anyway sometime. Okay. <laughs> yeah, please, absolutely. I'm sorry, I can't I can't hear you. Somebody's taking a light. That'd be a possible future opportunity. Up to five, but I for that. Awesome. 
if we could learn from indigenous people how to relate environments, that would have a difference in the That would be a potential basis for a relationship and for health. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I, in fact, I, I argued that in introduction uh, to a book in 1991 that no one reads, apparently pays no attention to. But I think that's right. I mean, indigenous people, and you'll know this from your experience, Kathy, have a very different way of relating to the environment because they're not, uh, they're not children of the book of Genesis. They don't believe the world was created for, by God for them specifically. They have a very different relationship to land. It, there, there's a found, there's a possible foundation for cooperation in environmental protection, restoration, rehabilitation. There, you know, I think, and uh, Gro Brundtland and the uh, United United Nations Commission in the late 1960s. I've forgotten what the Brundtland title. Commission. Brundtland Commission. The Brundtland Commission argued that, whatever that was. Sustainable. Yes, they're talking about sustain, sustainable economies, and they're talking about how non-Aboriginal people, non-Indigenous people, can learn from Indigenous people about that. It's the it's the difference between the Indigenous perception of the world they live in and the Judeo-Christian understanding of humans' place in the world we all live in. That's what it's about. Great. Well, thank you very much, Jim. I had the great fortune uh, to actually be a postdoc fellow with Jim soon after I finished my PhD. Then, as tonight, every single meeting, I learned something and was forced to sit and reflect and would often go away and go through a period of discernment to put together all of the, the puzzle pieces that Jim had laid out before me. And I think when we, we look at your, your depth and incredible breadth of knowledge and the amount of not only intellectual energy you've put in to understand these relationships, but the heart that you've put into understanding and the amount of, of passion that you brought to this. I, I thank you as a Canadian for continuing to make us aware of what our responsibilities are. And I, I think of the announcements in recent weeks about this new Canadians having a new requirement under revised citizenship oath to pledge to honour the Indigenous treaties. And I think tonight you've reminded me, as a Canadian citizen, I think I should also take some time and think about what that means for me as a Canadian that I'm doing in my research, in my acts as a Canadian citizen to honour those treaties. And as you reminded us, echoing the words of a, a Supreme Court judge, reminding us that we're all treaty people and that's something that we all share together. And that is a source of common ground or middle ground for Indigenous and non-Indigenous Canadians. So thank you very much, Jim. <laughs>